Oh, you can hear me now. <laughs> good morning. Uh, I hope you've had a good week. Everybody here had a good week? Yes? Good. And as Gareth said, we're starting um, a new series this morning. Did any of you, uh, as a matter of interest, see in the news yesterday a rather cool story about the Banksy painting of the girl with the balloon? Did anyone see it? For those of you that didn't, it's the kind of stuff that films were made of. This Banksy famous painting, Banksy's Girl with the Balloon, was sold at uh, Sotheby's for a million pounds a couple of days ago. And then just as the hammer went down, uh, the, the painting, the canvas, began to slide through the bottom of the frame and there was a hidden shredder in the frame that shredded the painting. And a couple of moments later, Banksy posted this uh, on his Instagram account uh, saying, going, going, gone. And it <laughs> I, don't know if you, I don't know if you can see this chap here on the phone, but his face, face kind of says it all. And um, I mean, quite a cool stunt, although now people are beginning to wonder whether actually it's doubled the value of the painting, the person that's got all the kind of shreds in his office. Um, Deborah Meaden uh, of Dragon's Den. Any Dragon's Den fans in here? Yeah, a few of you. Uh, she said uh, this about it. Banksy is officially the coolest, most poignant person on earth. I'm not sure I quite agree with that analysis of him, but she said, of course, it's a publicity stunt, but it's publicizing the sheer insanity of where we place our values. I think, you know, that's a fairly on-point statement. I think I might want to add, and where we place our money. And as I've said, as Gareth has said, we're starting a series this morning uh, for the next sort of month on uh, money. We're going to be looking at what God has to say to us uh, about money. I know it's something we absolutely love talking about, but it's a really good thing for us to be talking about. When Tim, my husband Tim, for those of you who don't know him, was at university, he shared in his uh, final year, he shared uh, a, a, a couple of rooms at the top of his uh, staircase in the college that he was at with uh, a friend who became a great friend. He became his best friend, a chap called Malcolm. And uh, like most students, they lived in and out of each other's rooms. Uh, they had a lot of fun together, and they both shared um, a bit of a weakness for chocolate. And in particular, actually, for Mars bars. I don't know if you knew that about Tim. He has a particular weakness for Mars bars. Anyway, it became a bit of an area of conflict for them, this whole thing about Mars bars and, you know, where the Mars bars got left and, and who ate them. So in the true spirit of maturity and Christian generosity, Tim got a briefcase and decided to put his Mars bars in a briefcase, which he then padlocked. <laughs> And he used to keep this briefcase in the middle of his room with a padlock on, and that his friend Malcolm and everyone else, they knew where the Mars bars were, but couldn't get hold of them. But the other thing that Tim did, just to make sure that the briefcase with the padlock never left the room, was that he padlocked the briefcase to, the, to a pillar that was in the middle of his room, so that the Mars bars couldn't be taken out in the briefcase by this chap either. And so, you know, he lived with this briefcase with this huge great chain on it around... Uh, this pillar in the middle of his room full of chocolate. I'm you know, happy to report that he's grown up a little bit since then. <laughs> but I wonder if that's a little bit how we kind of deal with the whole area of money. You know, I wonder if that's a bit of a picture that we kind of keep this area of money and our money and our attitudes towards money and the way we think about money and what we do with our money. A little bit locked up, a little bit out of reach. Don't really like to talk about it, don't really like to go there, don't really like other people to talk to us about it. I wonder. And it may or it may not surprise you to know that Jesus talked about money more than he talked about most other things while he was on earth. He talked about money more than he talked about heaven and hell. In fact, uh, half the parables, half the stories he told to the people that he was teaching about God and that were following him when he was here on earth, half of them were about money. And over 800 verses in the Bible specifically address the issue of money itself. Over 2,000 address the issue of money and possessions. It's one of the most referenced subjects of all. Why? Because money is an influence. Money 
has an influence on us and it influences our lives. It influences our lives for good and it can, influences, it can influence our lives for bad. According to a report, I don't know if any of you saw this, in the independent newspaper in January at the beginning of this year, money is the primary cause for marital, content, marital, marital conflict and marriage breakdown. Money has a huge influence on our lives. It can be used for great things, it can be used for bad things. Either way, we all spend loads of time thinking about money, working for money, spending money, maybe saving money, investing money, studying money, whatever. And the truth is that if we don't get a handle on our money, money gets a handle on us. That's why Jesus spoke about it so much. If we don't get a handle on money, money gets a handle on us. So over these October weekends, we're going to be thinking about and talking about and unpacking the whole area of money, getting it out of the briefcase unashamedly and hopefully inviting God, the God who loves us, to talk to us about money and, and help us to think about our relationship with it and our attitudes to it. And this week, I'm, you know, my objective, my aim is to try and get us thinking about money in a sort of slightly bigger picture perspective. And uh, we're going to look at a story in a little bit at, that Jesus told, uh, one of those stories that he told to his followers. But before we do, I just want to kind of briefly dispatch a few myths that do the rounds often in Christian circles. Maybe you know some of them are floating around here today, maybe not. But let's just kind of nail a few Christian myths before we uh, look at this story. First one, myth number one, money is basically bad. I think, you know, down the ages and, and often Christians act and talk as if somehow we think money is bad. Money can cause trouble, but money isn't bad in and of itself. Jesus, God, never says money, money is bad. God says the love of money is bad. They are two completely different things. Money can make all kinds of good things happen. 1 Timothy 6, it's the love of money that is bad. Here's another myth. You're more blessed if you're poor. I think that's a bit of a Christian myth, a bit of distorted thinking that can do the rounds. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that poverty is a blessing. You know, despite the fact that for many years and in many parts of the church, the church has made poverty a virtue, a kind of sign of holiness, nowhere does the Bible say that poverty is a blessing. If Jesus tells us to help the poor and poverty is a blessing, then we're going around robbing people of some kind of blessing and virtue that God's given them. Matthew 5, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Being poor in spirit is an attitude of the heart. It's an acknowledgement of our need. It's a a heart issue, not a wallet issue. Poverty is not a blessing or a virtue. Here's another myth. Jesus prefers poor people to rich people. I wonder what you'd say about that. Romans 2 verse 11, let's just dispatch that one. God has no favorites. Jesus does not favor poor people. One of his closest disciples and best friends was the Apostle John, and his dad was wealthy enough to have hired servants. The Bible tells us that. Jesus doesn't favor rich people. He doesn't favor poor people. God has no favorites and shows no partiality. I wonder if the same could be true about us. Do we treat people the same irrespective of their economic circumstances? Is that true of us, or do we show partiality? Here's another myth. God doesn't want anyone to be rich. I think that does the rounds at times, particularly with the story of the rich young ruler. And we know that Jesus says it's really, really, really hard, harder for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. It's wrong to pursue riches. God makes that clear because that's an issue of the heart, what we pursue But God doesn't say it's wrong to be rich, neither does Jesus. God was the one who made King Solomon the richest man on earth. Solomon didn't ask for riches, but God made him rich. It's not wrong to be rich. The answer is to learn how to handle riches if God decides to bless you in that way. But it's not wrong to be rich. Here's another myth. If Jesus had his way, everyone would have the same amount of money. What about the parable of the talents that Jesus tells? A story 
of a rich guy who gives five talents, which was a, a, you know, a, a lump sum of money, let's say thousands of pounds. He gives five lots of that quantity to one man, two to another, and one to someone else. They all had an equal opportunity to please the guy whose money it was and to make her be rewarded for their stewardship of that money, but they didn't all get the same amount of money. So let's just nail that one. God doesn't want everyone to have the same amount of money. He wants us to learn to handle the fact that he deals with us all differently. That's grace. That's grace. He treats us all equally, but he doesn't give us all the same amount of resources. And Jesus makes that clear in his stories. Here's another myth. He wants us to get to the point where we actually give away everything we have. Again, I think that's a conclusion that some of us draw from the parable of the rich young ruler. The guy who Jesus said, go away and sell all your money and then you can enter the kingdom. The reason he said that to the rich young ruler is because money had a grip on his heart. And Jesus wants us free from the grip of money. He doesn't want us without money. There might be a call on our lives to give to that extent, but that's not God's end goal for everyone. If that was, half the parables that he tells on money are pointless. He wants us, as I've said, to be able to handle money, not for money to handle us. Here's another myth that does the round in some areas of the Christian church. Money is a sign of God's blessing. I wonder what you think about that one. If you sell your soul to have a great salary, sacrifice your family life on the altar of your finances, or if you merely have a better job than your neighbor for whatever reason, that is not a sign of God's blessing. Money may be a blessing, it's a gift, and it helps us in all kinds of respects in life, but it's not a sign of God's blessing or favor. God's blessing and God's favor comes in all kinds of different shapes and sizes. Like I said, the parable of the talents makes that clear. The guy with one was no less blessed than the guy with five. You know, Jesus never made reference to money being a sign of blessing. Here's another myth wonder how many of us sign up to this one or wrestle with it, maybe. If I had more money, I'd be more generous. Do you know what? That's an insult to people who have very little and are unbelievably generous. Our generosity is totally unrelated to how much we have. Jesus tells the story of a widow who has hardly anything, and she puts two coins into the offering, and he tells everyone around who's watching her, I'm watching the rich give gifts out of their resources, but she's put in the most out of what little she has. Generosity is a proportion thing. Generosity, when the Bible talks about generosity, it's talking about the the proportion of what we give rather than how much, and it makes no difference how much we have. Here's another myth that I think permeates, has the potential to permeate our thinking because of the culture we live in. Debt is an okay way to fund our lifestyle. Again, this is God's teaching. This is what the Bible has to say about money. The Bible says all kinds of things about debt, and nowhere does it say anything positive about debt. It doesn't say that debt is wrong, and God's people are encouraged to be lenders of money in in, um, sacrificial and in um, facilitating ways to other people. But the Bible doesn't say anything good about debt. In fact, the opposite. In Proverbs 22, verse 7, the Bible says that a borrower is a slave to a lender. The spirit of the Lord is about freedom. Jesus said, I've come to set you free. And debt is a form of bondage. Jesus doesn't want us to be in debt. And if you're here this morning, and for whatever reason you find yourself in debt, God knows the pain and the pressure that being in that position puts on you and on your life, and he wants to set you free. He wants to help you. He doesn't judge you. He doesn't condemn you. He wants to set you free. And there are some amazing stories in this church family over the years of God helping people to become free from debt. Okay, last one. I have a completely healthy mindset towards money. With all respect, I think I would want to say that none of us in this room, including me with the microphone, have a totally healthy mindset towards money. 
We all bring, we're all shaped, we're all influenced by the world that we live in, by the, desire, the unrefined desires and the weakness and the brokenness of our own hearts. And we bring that, we bring those attitudes towards, to our attitude towards money. To have a healthy mindset towards money is to have God's mindset towards money. So he had that sense about God wanting to exchange sets of glasses again, putting on the pink glasses of faith. Well, that's seeing the way God sees. And to have a healthy mindset towards money, we need to be able to see and think about and deal with money in the way that God sees and thinks and deals with money. So yes, we'll all be on a journey... Hopefully, the renewing of the mind, we're transformed by the renewing of the mind as we walk with Jesus and allow God to love us, and it should be, he should be changing our mindset about money as we walk with him. But I'm pretty willing to bet there's nobody in this room, and I include myself in that, who's arrived. It's like, yeah, I've got a complete kingdom mindset about money. There's nothing else I need to learn. So hence the reason that we're looking at this subject over this month. So let's get on to the story. Luke chapter 16, verses 1 to 15. I'm not going to unpack it. We haven't got time. I'm just going to pull out a couple of principles from it. But it's the story of the shrewd manager. And before I read it, just a little heads up here. This is not a story where Jesus is encouraging dishonesty. The chap in the story is dishonest. That's not the point of the story. Jesus is not encouraging us to be dishonest with our money. But we haven't particularly got time to talk about that this morning. So here we go, the parable of the shrewd uh, manager. Jesus said, there was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day, a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. So the employer called out to him and said, what's this I hear about you? Get your report in order, because I'm going to fire you. The manager thought to himself, oh my word, now what? My boss is going to fire me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches and I'm too proud to beg. I know, I'll ensure that I have plenty of friends who will give me a home because I'm their friend when I'm fired. So he invited each person who owed him money to his employer. Sorry, he invited people who owed money to his employer to come and see him and discuss the situation. And he said to the first one, how much do you owe my employer? And the guy said, well, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager said, well, take the bill quickly and change it to 400 gallons. How much do you owe my employer? He said to the next man. Oh, well, I owe him a 1,000 bushels of wheat, was the reply. Here, the manager said, take the bill and change it to 800 bushels. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of light. This is Jesus talking, remember. Here's the lesson, he says. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then, when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you into an eternal home. If you're faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. If you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you? with the true riches of heaven. And if you're not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with the things of your own? No one can serve two masters. You'll hate one and you'll love the other. You'll be devoted to one and you'll despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. The Pharisees, who dearly loved their money, they heard all this and they scoffed at Jesus. And he said to them, you like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. So, it's an unusual story. I think it's one of the less familiar parables. Like I said, we're not going to unpack it bit by bit. I just want to pull out, having looked at some of the myths about money, like I said, we're doing a bit of a kind of broad picture introduction to money this morning. I want to pull out a couple of truths from this story about what Jesus is saying here about money. And the first one is this. Everything we have belongs to God. Everything we have belongs to God. Everything we have from our children, to our cars, to our houses, to our wallets, to our fridges, to our freezers, you name it, if you own it, it belongs to God. And because it belongs to God, we will take none of it with us 
when we leave this earth. We came into this earth with nothing, we leave with nothing. We just get to look after it for a while while we're here. And then, when we leave this earth, we get to stand before God and give him account, an account of what we did with it. Everything we have is on loan. And the manager in this story, the guy that this story is about, the manager who's working on behalf of, he's been entrusted by, with resources from the rich guy, Jesus is saying, you and I are like managers. And God has given us a load of stuff to manage for this season that we call life while we're here on earth. And it's easy, you know, to fall into the trap, or maybe we don't fall into the trap, maybe we're born in the trap and we don't ever get out of it, of thinking that everything we own is ours. Because it's either been given to us or we've worked for it and we've paid for it, so that's it, it's mine. But the Bible says that every good gift comes from God. Everything we have has either been given to us by him directly or the gifts that he's given us that enable us to earn money or whatever, it's all come from him. And if you're a parent, your children are actually his children too. Everything we have is on loan. This guy, Jesus says, was a manager handling the other chap's affairs. And God wants us to be good managers of his resources. He wants us to manage his stuff well. That's the implication of what Jesus is saying in verse 10. It's a principle he repeats over and over again. Well, if you can be trusted with a little, then you can be trusted with much. If you can handle the small things, well, I'll give you more. Jesus wants, to learn, Jesus wants us to learn to be good at handling his stuff and his resources and his money so that he can put us in charge with more. But that means managing, learning to steward things in a way that pleases him and blesses others. And we're going to look at the whole area of stewardship in a couple of weeks. But here's a quick question from this one for us this morning. How well are we taking care of God's resources that are in our hands for this season? How well are you taking care of the stuff that God has entrusted to you? What are you doing with what he's given you? Is that how you see it? The stuff that you own, the stuff that you have responsibility for, the stuff that's in your hands. Do you see it as as his? What are you doing with it? How well are you doing with it? Because if we see our stuff as God's stuff, do you know what? We automatically find it easier to look after it better and to, to involve him in the decisions we make and the, and the choices that we go after. Everything we own belongs to God. Here's the second truth from this story. Money is one of the things that God uses to test our hearts. God uses all kinds of things to test us. He uses power to test us. He gives us influence to test us. He, you know, Pressure tests us, tests what's in us. Money is something that tests what's in our hearts. Look at verse 14. Jesus says to the Pharisees who loved their money, I know what's going on in your hearts. He's connecting money and what they're doing on the outside with their money to what's going on in their hearts. God lets money test us. So money will show us a number of things if money's a test for us. Money will give us some clues as to what's really going on in our hearts, but like the lights on the dashboard, you know, when they go on, you know, the red oil light goes on and suddenly you know that there's a problem with the oil. Or if you're like us yesterday, the light goes on and your petrol meter says you've got no miles left in your petrol tank and it's five miles to the petrol station. Fortunately, that was a bit off that gauge. But God uses money to test us, to expose and to show us what's in our hearts. So one of the things it will show us is what we love most. Because we put our time and our money after, we put it after what we love most. So if you want to know what I love most, then look in my diary and look at my bank statement. It'll tell you an awful lot about what I value, what I care about, what really matters to me, what I'm attached to. And the same is true of you. If I was to look in your diary, if your neighbor, the guy sitting next to you, the woman sitting next to you was to look in your diary and in your bank account, they could, they could draw some pretty accurate conclusions about what you really love, what you're really attached to, what really matters to you, or what actually you can't break free from. Do you know? Do you know where you know, your money's going? Do you know what proportion of your money is going on you and your needs and on others and others' needs, kingdom stuff? 
My son was telling me yesterday, my oldest son, apparently there's a new digital kind of bank called Resolute. Any of you know about that? Oh, good, you look as blank as I do. <laughs> apparently, it's a banking app that you can get on your phone and you can do all your, phone, your banking digi di digitally. <laughs> and one of the things that this cool app does, he's, he's um, opened an account with it, is that every month it'll just draw you a pie chart on your phone and show you what proportion of your money is being spent on what things. I think that sounds pretty cool. Because none of us have, a have the time to draw pie charts, do we? You know, <laughs> half of us don't even have time to go through our bank statements on a regular basis. But I, it's really important to know where our money's going, because it tells us a lot about what is going on in our hearts. Let's be, let's be wise to that, you know, and if we don't know where our money's going, let's go home and get our bank statements out and have a look. Because what we're most attached to is what has the potential to control us, and that's what God's after. He doesn't want us controlled. He wants us free so that we can make the kind of choices that are healthy for us and are a blessing for others. So money shows us what has the potential to show us what we love most. It also, and hugely significantly, has the habit of showing us the state of our trust and our confidence in God. Money is one of those things that most powerfully shows us the state of our confidence and our trust in God. It shows us where our faith is. It shows us what we believe. Do I trust that I'm significant and valuable because God loves me and he's for me and he's with me and he's got a plan for me? Or do I need to keep pursuing possessions and acquiring things to have that sense of identity and value and significance? Do I feel more safe and secure when I have more money and less safe and secure when I have less money? Or does my confidence come from knowing that God is committed to me and will be forever and is committed to looking after me and providing for me? Do I believe that I would worry less if I had more money? Classic lie of the enemy. Or is my trust in God so I don't need to worry? That's what Jesus said, didn't he? Don't worry. Money tests our hearts and shows us the state of our confidence in God and his goodness and his commitment to us. My youngest son, Joshi, many of you know him. We took him up to university at the weekend. He had a gap year last year, and uh, last summer he committed to going on this phenomenal gap year program in Canada that began in January this year. And um, he had between August and December to raise the no small, no insignificant sum of four and a half thousand pounds to uh, fund this trip. And bless him, he looked for a job, and he found a job in the house of Fraser, which uh, nearly bought him to death. He was in the Hugo Boss outlet and, you know, hard, sold about one item a week. And um, he kept looking for a full-time job, and that full-time job kept eluding him. And he got to the point where he began to panic about his money and that he wouldn't have enough to make this gap year work that he'd already committed to and paid a deposit for. And so uh, at the beginning, and so he stopped giving away his money, he stopped uh, tithing his money. And um, at the beginning of October last year, God began to give him a bit of a nudge. And he began to talk to him and challenge him about the fact that he'd stopped giving away his money. And actually, that was a sign that he wasn't really trusting that God was going to provide. So bless him, at the end of October, he told, us all the, he told us this later in retrospect. He said to God, OK. I feel really convicted about this, and I want to trust you. My paycheck's coming next week, and I'm going to give you the first 10% of my money, even though I don't think I'm going to have enough. So the following Monday, he gave uh, you know, the first 10% away. And the next day, he had a phone call from somebody who said, I just feel convicted, Joshie, that I'm meant to be giving you £1,000 towards your trip to Canada. And he got back more than 10 times what he had given away. And he didn't give away his money to get back anything from God. He, he, he stepped back into that generosity and giving away as a sign, God, I know that I need to trust you more, and this is one of the ways I can do it. Now, I will be honest here and say I am somebody who is really prone to worry about money. You know, I, it's an area where I've wrestled with fear in my life. I'm much less fearful about it now than I used to be because I've seen God provide miraculously for so many, you know, over so many years and in so many different occasions. But that doesn't mean that I'm free from worry. It's something that I wrestle with. It's a battle that I fight from time to time. And there will be many of us in this room who know what it's like to worry about money. That's one of the reasons Jesus talks about it so much. 
But I think there is basically one belief under an anxiety about money. There will be all kinds of nuances, but I think there's one underlying belief when we worry about money, when we're anxious about money, and that's this, that there won't be enough. That there won't be enough, that I won't have enough. And it's the same belief that prevents us being more generous, and it's the same belief that prevents us giving away our money to God, tithing, no matter how many amazing explanations we might give. Underneath our anxiety about money is that there won't be enough, I won't have enough. And that mindset, that set of glasses, and for some of us here this morning, God is wanting to change those glasses. For some of us, that set of glasses, it's a poverty mindset. It's a mindset that fears lack, that God won't have enough for me or won't provide for me. It's a poverty mindset. It's the kind of mindset that the, that the people had when they saw this woman wasting a beautiful, expensive jar of perfume all over Jesus' feet. It's like, oh, there won't be enough. That should have gone to the poor. And that a poverty mindset, let's be really honest about this, friends, can look really religious and really pious and really Christian. Oh, that should have gone to the poor. What were you doing? But actually, the root of that mindset is that there isn't enough money for the poor in God's kingdom and to be extravagant in other ways. A poverty mindset says there won't be enough. God's pie is limited. And so if we do this with it over here, we can't do this with it over here. Is that how we see God with limited resources? In 1929, the Dallas Theological Seminary, which is one of the main theological training colleges in America, was about to close its doors as they were about to be declared bankrupt. And uh, the trustees declared a prayer meeting. They were storming around a room praying. And one of them, Harry Ironside, prayed to the God of Psalm 50. And he prayed out loud, God, you own the cattle of a thousand hills. He knew the God he was praying to. And he said, Lord, sell some cattle and give us the money. And while they were still praying, somebody turned up with a check for $10,000. And the, the seminary, which is still you know, open for business today, was rescued. I love that. A man praying with a kingdom mindset about a God to a God of abundance that's got more than enough and wants to pour his money and resources into the hands of people that know how to steward it. When I was 23... And I was meditating on a, on a verse in Luke 15. It was my daily devotional. And it's a verse that, that Jesus says, everything I have is yours. If you don't know that, learn it. Everything I have is yours. I was thinking about this verse and praying about it. And God said something to me that has forever changed my view of him as a father. And he said this, Hills, is there anything that the richest oil shake on earth couldn't give his daughter? And I said, No. <laughs> pretty you know, simple question. And he said to me, well, I'm richer than the richest oil shake, and you're my daughter. And I'm telling you now, because he spoke to my heart, and it changed the way I looked at him as a father. And yes, I have to go back to that again and again, when I find myself being sort of assaulted by a bit of a poverty mindset, and I begin to worry that I won't have enough when I begin to think like a pauper rather than like a daughter of the richest person in the universe. And if you're sitting here and you're wondering whether he loves you enough to give you what you need and more than you need, learn Romans 8, verse 32. This is the Passion Translation of it. For God has proved his love by giving us his greatest treasure, his Son, the most precious, valuable gift, and he's given Jesus for us. And since God freely gave us his son as the sacrifice for us all, he certainly isn't going to withhold anything else. He's given us the thing that he was most likely to hold back, and he, he gave Jesus and Paul's saying, because he gave the most precious thing, of course he's going to give us everything else that we need. The money shows us how much we trust God. It also shows us, lastly, about whether God can trust us. When my finances begin to get out of control, 
And when my finances begin to become a mess, do you know what? My life is beginning to get out of control and my life is beginning to become a mess. And for some of us this morning, God's wanting to put his finger on that and say, come on, I want to help you. I'm a God who brings order out of mess. He doesn't leave us to try and sort it out on our own. He wants to help you. We have an amazing ministry here called Money Matters. There's a chap called Duncan Harkness, and he freely gives of his time and his advice and his wisdom to help us as a church family and others beyond learn God's ways about money. God wants us in control of our money rather than money being in control of us. It's why giving is so important, because giving is where the rubber hits the road, and it begins to show us how much control money has over us. We'll talk about that again another time. Despite the fact that God's given us his resources on loan, he wants to help us do a good job with them. Jesus is looking. This parable is about Jesus saying, I'm looking for people, God is looking for people that can handle resources well. It's not, oh, I don't want any of you to have resources. It's I want people to be able to ha- who can handle money so I can give them more money. Money, when it's in the hands of the right people, does a phenomenal amount of good. It's a resource. And he's saying, I want people in this story who can handle worldly wealth. He's talking about worldly wealth, not spiritual wealth. Here, we're, He's talking about worldly wealth. We've got some friends who uh, have a lot of money, but the, what they do with their money is incredible. They invest it in all kinds of places. They've opened up a school in Uganda for, for special needs children. They give to all kinds of people. They're not partial with their money. And I look at them sometimes and I think, gosh, well, if I was God, I'd give them more because <laughs> they're really good at using God's resources in a phenomenal way. The world doesn't do a great job at handling wealth, does it? I mean, most days there's a story of corruption or bankruptcy or you know, misuse of, of other people's money in the press. The world doesn't do a great job with money. And Jesus doesn't say that's because money's bad and nobody can handle it. He's going, I'm looking for a people that can do money well. He wants his church to do money well, to set the example for others, to be the place, to be the people that he can trust resources to for the sake of those beyond our borders. But if we're going to handle money well, we have to have a healthy attitude to it. We have to allow God to shape our mindset about it. We have to let him talk to us about it so that we can steward it as those good managers in the way he wants us to. Jesus wants our hearts healthy. He wants our hearts healthy, free from the love of money, free from an attachment to things, free from, an ad- free from addict- addictions to stuff. You know, gambling is on the rise in this nation. We are vulnerable where it comes to money, but God wants us free, free from all the harm that it can do so that we can be a blessing with our resources to others. But that means being willing to unlock the briefcase and get it out as a subject and talk about it and think about it, not just while we're in the building for a few moments on a Sunday, but in our you know, times with the Lord, maybe even with each other, and acknowledge there's this set of kingdom glasses that God wants us to see through, which will lead to blessing in a huge way, but only if we will let him teach us, stretch us, help us, shape us when it comes to handling worldly wealth. So why don't we stand? might want to shake a leg. Don't kick the person next to you, but we've got a few minutes left. And if you're a visitor here, I know we've got some visitors amongst us this morning. We like to end our times together by just spending a bit of time opening our hearts up to the way that the Lord wants to invite a response from us and to anything else he might want to do in us. So as the band make their way back up here, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And we're just going to invite the Holy Spirit to come. Actually, you might want to put a hand on your heart. Let's just pray for our own hearts in this moment. If you want a healthy heart and a healthy relationship with money, let's just 
put our hands on our hearts and just pray for a few moments. Father, we thank you that you are a good, good father. And that because you are a good, good father, you are generous beyond compare. We thank you for the many gifts of grace that you have poured into our lives to this point in time. And we thank you for the many more that you are longing to release into our lives because your goodness and your generosity pursues us every day of our lives. So Holy Spirit, we just invite you to come. To come in this moment and to do what you want to do in us. Holy Spirit, you no longer write your law on tablets of stone. You write it on our hearts. And we give you permission in this moment to come and do some rewriting on our hearts. some of you, I just think in this moment, God is inviting you just to allow him to draw near to you, to talk to you, and to speak to you about money. And even that feels scary for some of you because you don't know what he's going to say and you don't know what he's going to invite you to do or tell you to do. And just welcoming him. To move in your heart about money is itself an act of trust. So just give him permission in the quietness of your heart to do that. I just think the way that God wants us to, to end our time together today might look and feel a bit messy, but God's okay with mess. Jesus was born in a manger. I believe that there are some of us here that know that we need to do business with him this morning. Maybe it's acknowledging our fears. For some of us, it's just surrendering this area of our lives to him again. And actually, you need to come and do that at the front and allow someone to pray with you. I also had this sense that there were people here for whom there is, there is chaos going on in other areas of your lives. It's got nothing to do with money. And actually, the Lord wants to establish his lordship over those parts of your lives that you're desperate to see him move. But it's about coming and surrendering whatever it is, those areas where there is chaos. So if that's you, I want to invite you to, to come to the front and allow someone to pray for you. I also believe that God wants us to pray for anybody in here who is looking for a job, for the provision, the very practical provision of a job. I believe that God wants us to pray for those of us in here who are in business and have control and responsibility for areas of finance. God wants to anoint you to, to look and to serve him, to look at that area and to serve him in that way with kingdom eyes, to replace your, your, your glasses, as it were. And there are some of us that just we know that we have a poverty mindset and we want today to take a step in allowing God to begin to break that. And again, I want to encourage you to come to the front and allow somebody to pray for you. That's how we do it here. We minister to each other as the family of God. But as we do that and as we pray, I also believe that the rest of us need to, to, to sing that song again that we sang, that God 
reigns, that our God reigns, almost as a declaration of faith over not just our lives and our circumstances, but over our money and our hearts, as a, as a declaration of faith and of confidence that he does reign, that he is sovereign, that he is the one who provides, and that he will provide where we need to see breakthrough. So a bit messy, I want to invite you to come down to the front. For those of you who can come and pray, just begin to make your way down. If you need prayer for healing and the rest of us, let's just not switch off in this moment, but let's declare that truth that God reigns over each other, over our circumstances and over our financial lives. So if we could have some people to pray to come and come down to the front as well. If you're in business and you, want, you just want a an, an fresh anointing of the Lord to, to serve him in that way, if you want to come down to the right-hand side, and let's just really raise the roof with this declaration of confidence in our loving Father.
We're going to continue with, a, as we often do here, a messy end. If you would like prayer and you've not come forward for prayer, I encourage you to do so. And encourage us as a church to continue to reflect on what the Lord has been saying to us this morning about the resources that he gives to us to be good stewards of all that he gives to us. Let's pray God's blessing over you as you go. Blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon each and every one of us now and forevermore. Amen. It's tea and coffee being served at, just across the road in uh, Trinity House. Do go and help yourself. Um, carry on our conversations there as we pray here at the front. Thank you. God bless. <laughs>